welcome to everyone for this EC seminar, webinar, and another one. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm Theodore de Witt. I'm I will be your host for today as, as for the whole series. And this is just a reminder this, that we are having now a series on, on risk associated with the space environment. And so we we address different effects. And today we have with us Ilko Dornbos, and he's a specialist in satellite drag. <laughs> so he's going, I mean, his whole career has been um, uh, focused on um, on um, artificial uh, debris satellites or, uh, or debris in space, modeling these, their propagation, um, their aerodynamics. And so Ilko, um, he, he graduated from the Delft University of Technology, where he worked for some time. And now, since um, 2019, he works at the Kane Academy, uh, the Dutch Meteorological Institute. Um, again in the Netherlands, and he's been also deeply involved in the in the Gotch and and um, swarm missions. So um, it's a real pleasure to have you with us, Ilko, because you're really the specialist on this on these issues. Let me just remind you um, that if you have questions, please write them down in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we will have plenty of time to go through them or to talk directly to, to Ilko. With this, I think we are ready to start. So Ilko, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> we'll take it away. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for this uh, this invitation to talk about this, uh, this topic that is very dear to my heart, satellite drag effects on satellite operations and debris in low Earth orbit. So as a sort of overview on the left here, I will uh, give a, an introduction. Uh, why is this important? Um, and then I will continue uh, to, to talk about some of the basics of the upper atmosphere, its dynamics, uh, but also satellite drag and orbital dynamics and uh, the observations that we have on those. And then uh, there will be a section on impacts on space operations and issues related to space debris. And I will conclude with uh, the way forward. Uh, on the right here, I've, I've put some screenshots of uh, YouTube movies of uh, uh, past uh, EC seminar series talks, um, because this is such a wide ranging topic and there are lots of, you know, uh, intersections with other uh, topics. Uh, for example, uh, Sean Lillenstein last week talked about uh, the polar lights and, and as I will talk about later, this is closely related also to uh, this topic. Um, Environmental sustainability is closely related, and uh, uh, I think last year there was also a talk about uh, uh, an entire talk about space debris, and I think uh, a lot of different aspects about space debris. So if you're interested in that, I, uh, I can highly recommend uh, looking at uh, the archive of um, of ISI. So why uh, are we interested in this? Well, let me start by a couple of uh, recent news items. This was November last year. Um, uh, the Chinese are building their space station and they're launching big modules uh, using very large rockets. And uh, these rockets return um, to Earth after a couple of days, a couple of days after launch. And they do so in an uncontrolled way. So, um, yeah, there are uh, institutes or agencies that uh, try to track um, the debris and also the re entering debris. And this is a particularly uh, large part, uh, large piece of debris. So there was, there was some concern. And in this case, uh, it actually led to uh, the closing of uh, the airspace in um, a large part of Spain. So you can see the sort of the flight radar tracking uh, where there are no planes in um, the north uh, of Spain. Um, and it, this was just temporary uh, until the debris was moving over. Um, but it was in the predicted path, so that, that was the reason why this decision was made. Uh, it turned out, uh, on the bottom right, you can see the actual um, uh, re-entry location, that uh, the satellite stayed on orbit uh, a bit longer, and it re-entered over uh, the uh, eastern Pacific, um, yeah, I think, uh, quite a bit later. So I don't know exactly how long. Um, another example from the news was uh, last year in February, so almost a year ago, uh, there was a launch of Starlink satellites and uh, that happened on uh, February 3 and a couple of days later, uh, SpaceX Starlink put on this, this message on their website uh, that the recently deployed Starlink satellites, uh, quite a lot of them had uh, um, been lost, they were already re-entering or some had already re-entered 
and um, yeah, this is also due to to drag on these uh, on these objects, which was higher than expected. And uh, the reason uh, that they're given here was uh, a geomagnetic storm that uh, that increased the drag. So I will um, uh, towards the end of the talk uh, go in a little bit more detail on on, uh, on these types of topics. Um, but for now, let me start with uh, an overview of the basics of the upper atmosphere, satellite drag, and orbital dynamics. Uh, so here I have on the left a graph of the, the, the temperature in the atmosphere, and we start at zero kilometers at the ground, and we have, of course, this thin layer, the troposphere, that we're all very familiar with. Um, if we go up uh, hiking in the mountains, we, we find that it's getting colder. Um, but uh, with balloon flights and, and airplanes, we now know that uh, higher, even higher up, uh, the temperature starts to increase again. So there's this layering to the atmosphere. And these layers have names, the troposphere, the stratosphere. Um, and there are these inflection points, these turning points in, in the temperature. Uh, then you get the mesosphere and uh, all the way at the top, the thermosphere. So the thermosphere starts at about 80, 90 kilometers altitude. Uh, and from that point, the temperature starts increasing to uh, asymptotically to, uh, to a value. Um, and above about 400 kilometers, it stays more or less uh, constant. But you can also see in this graph that there are large differences, not only between day and night, but also between low solar activity and high solar activity. So this is the 11 year solar cycle is the main driver of this, this solar activity. Um, but there are also 27 day variations. That's the rotation period of the sun. If there are big active regions on the sun, such as right now, then uh, solar activity will be higher. Uh, and if that is only on happening on part of the sun, then after 27 days, this, this region will have returned. But in the meantime, there will be a little dip in solar activity. And then there will also be these uh, peaks and dips in the temperature of the upper atmosphere. Um, these changes in temperature, they also um, are linked to changes in the density. So that's the graph on the right. Um, the, basically, the temperature determines the scale height of the upper atmosphere. And uh, it doesn't look like much variation, but uh, between the tick marks on the bottom in this density plot, you can see five orders of magnitude. Uh, so if you look all the way at the top at 600 kilometers, the difference between day and night is, is already almost an order of magnitude. And, and the difference between high and low solar activity can be two or three orders of magnitude at those altitudes. So uh, the variability there is, is, is enormous compared to what we're used to in the, the lower layers of the atmosphere. And included in this plot are a couple of satellites. These are all satellites that I've used for my research. Um, uh, these are all satellites that carry accelerometers. So they can very accurately and with high cadence measure the acceleration of the satellite. And these are very special uh, for this type of research. Uh, this is a, a, a picture from a book that I try to make a little bit nicer with colors. Uh, but it, it, the main reason I want to show it is that uh, this, this uh, layering in terms of temperatures uh, on the left is not the only way that you can make a distinction between layers in the atmosphere. Um, and the uh, upper atmosphere is actually quite different from the lower atmosphere. So not only in terms of composition, we're used to about 20% oxygen, um, molecular oxygen, 80% uh, nitrogen. Uh, but this this changes if you go above about 100 kilometers. There we get a variation in composition, and this is related to the the third column uh, to differences in vertical transport. Uh, basically, at lower altitudes, the atmosphere is so dense that everything mixes quite well. There are lots of collisions um, between the the gas particles. At higher altitudes, the atmosphere becomes so uh, the density becomes so low um, that we get um, molecular diffusion and um, at even higher altitudes, particles can even escape uh, the gravity field of the Earth. Uh, I will not go into too much detail here, uh, but just to show that, uh, um, yeah, it's not only uh, the changes in the temperature, but at these very low densities, we also get very different physics. Uh, this is a, a picture of the, the composition. Again, we at the bottom here, uh, zero kilometers altitude, we get our familiar uh, uh, composition that we're all used to, but you can see that at this, the altitude of, uh, of satellites um, in low Earth orbits, uh, we get atomic uh, species. So atomic oxygen, atomic nitrogen, helium and hydrogen. Uh, so this is in the, the, the percentage of the mass. And in this graph, the top row shows the absolute number of particles. And uh, the, the x-axis scale is logarithmic. Uh, 
So you can see the sort of straight lines on this graph. That means there's sort of a constant scale height. But these scale heights are different for the different species. And uh, yeah, that's an important part of the um, dynamics of the upper atmosphere that we, we have these different uh, concentrations. So how uh, is all of this driven? What are the, the causes of these large variations um, between solar min and solar max and day and night? And, and I will talk about some more uh, in a couple of slides as well. Um, well, there are, are uh, various energy sources for the upper atmosphere. In the middle here, I have put solar radiation heating and I've put uh, different pictures of the sun in different wavelengths. Um, of course, visible light and infrared radiation of the sun reaches the surface, but uh, ultraviolet, far ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, those are absorbed at different heights in the atmosphere. And this is a large reason why we get these different uh, slopes in the temperature in the different layers of the atmosphere. Um, the upper atmosphere is also connected to the lower atmosphere through waves and tides, and there are cooling processes that happen, of course. And um, these cooling processes are more effective in uh, the lower part of the upper atmosphere than in the upper part. Just these uh, atomic species, uh, they are not so good at cooling. That's also why you get these very high temperatures in the upper atmosphere. And then the last part here is heating by particle pre precipitation and ionosphere currents. And the picture that I put here in this, uh, um, this is a picture of the aurora. And, and uh, this is uh, very closely related to uh, the aurora. So we have, uh, if, if you were present at the last week's talk, we've heard that uh, there are energetic particles that come from the magnetosphere through the interaction between the solar wind and the magnetosphere into the upper atmosphere. And these cause the aurora, at least the electrons do. Um, but these particles, they also, um, you know, bump into the neutral particles and cause them to heat up. Uh, and also the friction between uh, the different ways the, the, the charged particles and neutral particles move. Uh, that, that's called joule heating, and uh, that also calls heating of the upper atmosphere. And basically, the entire atmosphere above expands. So this is a very complex uh, plot, but basically, it shows uh, in the white line as a function of wavelength um, the, the the solar uh, irradiance. And uh, these are very low wavelengths. So we are looking here at extreme ultraviolet and X-rays, and you can see how these are absorbed in the the, the colored background. Um, uh, at different altitudes, depending on uh, on their wavelength. I will not go too deeply into that, but that is basically why um, the thermosphere and the ionosphere are heated. Also, why the ionosphere is created, because this energy also causes um, the molecules to split apart into atoms, but also the, the electrons uh, getting separated from the atoms so that we get ions and electrons. Um, so this um, um, aurora-related heating of the upper atmosphere, um, it, it's happening mostly through a process or, or most intensely during a process which we call geomagnetic storms. And for that, we really have to look at uh, space weather in more detail. And there are more space weather-related talks already on the, uh, this, this webinar series. And there will be, I think, also in the, in the next weeks. Um, so, um, but, but we basically get eruptions from the sun. Uh, the solar wind is very variable, and sometimes we get coronal mass ejections. Uh, we get high-speed streams. Um, they, the, these are particles that travel with hundreds of kilometers per second, uh, per second uh, in all directions. And uh, in some cases, uh, there are large clouds of particles, these coronal mass ejections that, that travel in the direction of the Earth and uh, can then uh, interact with the magnetosphere of the Earth. So that's the, basically the, the shells of magnetic field lines that are represented in this, uh, uh, in this figure on the right. Uh, you can also see these um, red waves on the right. Um, so that, that's a representation of the, uh, the radiation from the sun that travels straight, straight through. It doesn't care about the magnetic field lines, and it hits the, the Earth on the day side. But these, uh, these particles from the solar wind and the particles in the magnetosphere, they have a very complex interaction. Uh, so here we can see a, a space weather simulation of uh, a cloud of particles that uh, is emitted from the sun in the center, and, and the Earth is green on the right. This was a, a storm in, uh, or a, yeah, sort of solar storm that happened in March 2015. And uh, you can see this cloud basically hitting the Earth 
uh, on uh, March uh, 17. Um, this is a simulation of a different geomagnetic storm, but it gives a basic idea of uh, you know, what the, the magnetic field lines look like. And uh, I think it's the density of the, of the plasma environment from a numerical simulation of the magnetosphere. And as the uh, cloud of particles hits the magnetosphere, we can see very large changes. Uh, it's uh, not showing what I expected. Yeah, here it is. Um, this, this change in uh, and compression on the day side of the Earth, and uh, yeah, large changes in the in the field lines, and these set in motion um, currents of charged particles in the magnetosphere, um, and uh, it's also uh, quite a complex topic, and too much to go into uh, for this talk, um, but what is important is that uh, part of this current system. Uh, enters the upper atmosphere uh, in the polar areas. And this happens in the polar areas in a sort of oval around the magnetic pole, um, because there the, the field lines are connected to faraway regions um, of the magnetosphere, uh, where the magnetosphere is in contact with uh, the solar wind, or is, is most influenced by the solar wind. Uh, so that is why we don't see the aurora at low latitudes usually, uh, and also why this heating mechanism is uh, at these high latitudes, as I will show in a minute. So this is another way to look at it, the, the different ways of uh, energy input, um, extreme ultraviolet directly on the day side, um, frictional heating and particle precipitation at high latitudes, uh, and then thirdly, upward propagating waves and tides globally. And we have this indirect effect at high latitudes through the magnetosphere. Uh, this is an animation of a model called uh, WACMX. Um, it's a whole atmosphere coupled climate model with an extension to the thermosphere ionosphere. And here I just show the lower part and the, the, the temperature variation. And we can see these, these changes between the different shades of blue are these, these, these gradients in the temp temperature for the different layers. And this already shows it's a bit more complicated than what I showed earlier. Uh, we see sometimes temperature inversions. So we get darker shades and then lighter shades and then darker shades again in the mesosphere, for example. And uh, we can already see a little bit of movement happening here. Uh, this is highly uh, sped up uh, simulation. You can see the time running in the bottom left. Um, but if we um, zoom out and uh, look at temperatures higher up, you have to change the color scale because the temperatures are so much higher. Otherwise, you won't see variation. And there you see a quite a different behavior. So we see a bulge on the afternoon and then uh, lower temperatures on the night. And basically the movement that you see here, uh, sorry, yeah, to, to start it again. Uh, the movement that you see here, um, you see, basically also see an expansion on the left and uh, uh, or on the, the day side and a contraction of the atmosphere on the night side. And the heights in this, this visualization of the model are exaggerated 50 times. And what you can also already see here is uh, um, the extra energy source at the high latitudes. You see this all this wiggling, uh, higher temperatures um, uh, at the at the North Pole coming in. Uh, this is all happening on this um, um, day in March where we had a large geomagnetic storm. And what you see here is just the start of the storm. And if I continue the animation, we can see how the storm progresses. And um, a lot of energy is put in at the high latitudes, but you can see that it generates waves that, that travel all the way down to the lower latitudes. And, and now we see that the entire uh, upper atmosphere is heated up. It's a lot, the, the colors are a lot warmer than, uh, than at the, the start of the animation. Uh, so this entire system is, uh, uh, has increased in temperature. And um, yeah, the moving surface that you see is a pressure surface. Uh, so you can imagine if you fly with the satellite through this, um, you encounter a, a large increase in the density uh, due to this. Uh, this is a very complex uh, visualization of uh, one of the swarm satellites uh, flying through this. On the right, you see um, uh, um, horizontal slice at 470 kilometers, which was the approximate altitude of the Swarm C satellite during this storm. And... Uh, and when I set it in motion, you will see some colored dots that represent the actual observations of the density. These are also plotted in the, in the um, sort of 2D graph uh, on the bottom. 
And on the left, you see uh, measurements of the magnetic field from the satellite itself uh, that also made very accurate magnetic field measurements, uh, but also magnetometers on the ground. These are these, these little dots, but when the storm starts, you will see the sort of vectors appearing and, and changing. And overlaid on that is also um, uh, the input into the model in terms of field aligned current density. So those are these currents that come from far away in the magnetosphere. Uh, and 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 uh, yeah, put the particles into the uh, atmosphere. Uh, so red and blue are are inward and outward currents, and uh, that's also repeated on the right. You, you basically see sort of two color bars overlapping there, uh, two color scales. But uh, when I put it in motion, you will see that it, um, yeah, when you see this red or blue color, you can also see uh, enhanced densities. So we will start with uh, some days before the storm. You can already see some of the magnetometers on the ground on the left uh, in the sort of the rural areas uh, getting some signal. Uh, this is March 15. The storm will start on the 17th. But there are already some, some smaller um, perturbations in the magnetic field from time to time. And this is something that happens continuously, uh, especially when, uh, when solar activity is, uh, is large. Um, it uh, happens to a larger extent. But even when the sun is very quiet, we can see uh, Sort of magnetometers wiggling a bit uh, from time to time, and uh, that means also that there are these currents from the magnetosphere putting energy in the upper atmosphere. So we're now getting into the afternoon of the 16th, so a couple of hours before the storm. Um, let's see. It's now the 17th, and the storm will soon uh, start, and we can see that the, the observed density from storm C is about 0.6 times 10 to the minus 12 kilogram per cubic meter. And now the storm has started. And you can see that the, the scale on the y-axis here on the right uh, is changing. We're now already seeing peaks of five and a half. So that's a sort of 10 times increase in, in, in density, uh, the maximum density during a pass over the pole uh, by the satellite. Uh, so you can see that this is a very big event in terms of uh, the density encountered by the satellite um, as it travels through the upper atmosphere. Uh, let me just go back to this, the start of the storm again. You can see that it happens in two phases. This is a sort of yeah, first phase, and then at about two o'clock, so the uh, um, what we call a huge substorm that feeds into this uh, heating of the upper atmosphere. And uh, you can see the, the the massive increase in density there. And also the comparison between the, the, the model and uh, the IGCM model in this uh, location and uh, the Swarm C satellite. Uh, so now the Swarm C satellite is actually giving lower densities than the model. So the actual thermosphere was already cooling more rapidly uh, than the model in this case. So these are the types of observations based on satellite drag that we can use to, um, um, yeah, to assess models like this. Uh, and 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 see how accurate they are and where they're where they are good and where there are maybe shortcomings that can be uh, improved. So now from the thermosphere we go to how satellite drag actually works. I will also not go too deeply into this, um, and I will not get any equations. But what's important to know is that the drag and also the decay rate of a satellite are proportional to the density of the atmosphere. And and as we've just seen, this is driven by solar EUV emissions and solar wind magnetosphere interaction and also to a lesser degree by uh, uh, what's happening and coming up from the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere. Uh, but it's also proportional to the area to mass ratio of the satellite or uh, a degree object. Um, so that's a property of, of the object. Um, you can imagine that the larger the area, the more drag you experience. Uh, yeah, you have to divide by the mass to, to, to get um, uh, the drag acceleration, if you if you uh, talk in terms of the drag force, then uh, you don't divide by the mass. But uh, the acceleration is is what drives the decay rate. And then there's also uh, a drag coefficient. So this depends on the shape of the object and to some extent also on the temperature and composition of the atmosphere. And uh, on the right, I have uh, put a graph of a, a theoretical model of the drag and the lift on a, a flat plate. And you can imagine, of course, any satellite as being built up of a number of these flat plates. If you have a very simple satellite that looks like a box, you can put six of these plates 
uh, into a, a model and then combine the drag and the lift of each of these. If you calculate the um, the angle of um, uh, the gas particles with respect to each of these plates. And this looks uh, more or less like a cosine, as you might expect if you would have a uh, um, yeah, very simple model. But you can see that at 90 degrees, it does not go exactly to zero. So if you have a, a flat plate that's that's flying uh, uh, the side of a satellite that's flying aligned with uh, the velocity of the satellite, then there's also still um, a small piece uh, uh, contributing to uh, the total drag of the satellite. And so if you have a very elongated satellite shape, um, then uh, this, this can add up. And, uh, and, and, and that's important. Um, on the bottom, it's a bit complex, but there you also see that there's a dependence on the mass of the gas, gas particles. And you can make a similar graph uh, for temperature. And basically, if you have a, a sort of front plate of the satellite, you can see it's almost a flat line, except if you go into helium and hydrogen. Um, Gas particle masses, um, but if you have these uh, this this very elongated shape, if you have a lot of uh, area of your satellite that's in line with the velocity, uh, then there's a, a larger dependence on uh, the composition in the uh, upper atmosphere. If you fly in a region where you have more helium, uh, you will see a much larger uh, drag coefficient uh, than if you're flying in uh, oxygen. So there's a large uncertainty because the, the satellites that we uh, have these acceleration measurements for, they usually or uh, basically in recent times never had instruments that measured the composition. And that's a huge um, uh, deficiency in, in the science of, of this field. Uh, we do not have the information on the composition and the temperature, so we do not know exactly what the drag coefficient is. So if we want to translate between measured accelerations and upper atmospheric densities, then uh, yeah, this introduces an error. and um, Future missions that are targeted at measuring upper atmospheric densities through accelerations, it would be really helpful to put a good mass spectrometer on those missions uh, yeah, to help untangle uh, this. Um, so now you can look at uh, different satellites. This is a picture <laughs> from very long ago. Uh, these are the Envisat and uh, ERS, ERS-2 satellites. Um, and uh, these were two satellites that were flying in the same orbit. Uh, basically, Envisat was sort of a successor, the Earth of, European Earth Observation Satellite successor of the ERS series of satellites. And it was huge, 8,000 kilograms. Uh, ERS was also quite large already, 2,500 two uh, kilograms. Um, and and at, at first instance, you might expect that the larger satellite has more drag, has larger area. But since you have, divide by the, have to divide by the mass, it's actually... Uh, Envisat, which is less susceptible to drag, it has a lower decay rate than uh, than ERS-2, and that's because uh, the mass scales with the volume of the satellite, so that's basically a characteristic dimension uh, cubed, um, and the uh, area, of course, is uh, correct characteristic dimension squared, so there's this squared cube law, and this means that if you have a small satellite, um, it is more susceptible to drag. And you can imagine these modern uh, CubeSats, which are sometimes just 10 by 10 uh, by 10 centimeter cubes. Uh, yeah, if you can imagine uh, one of these uh, people that are in there for skill, you can imagine how small such a satellite is. Uh, these, these are much more susceptible to drag. They will have much higher decay rates. Uh, I also always like to, uh, to have a look at uh, history and uh, uh, to me, these uh, this, this very early days of the space age is a uh, very interesting time. That's, that, that's when the first knowledge about the upper atmosphere from uh, the movement of satellites was inferred. And this is a paper on the left uh, by uh, Jakia. I think he worked at the Smithsonian at the time. Um, and he plotted the orbital accelerations of the satellites. And they, they call it in this paper 1957 Beta 1. So that means the second satellite launched in 1957, in other words, Sputnik 2, and um, compares it with uh, the um, distance between the sun and uh, the lowest point in the orbit. This was the, the satellites at the time were in uh, elliptical orbits. So most of the drag was due to uh, the position of the satellite or the height and, and the, the time of day of the satellite at its lowest point. And this drifted over time uh, due to the influence of the Earth's gravity field. 
Uh, so sometimes it was on the night side of the uh, Earth, and sometimes it was on the day side. And uh, Jakia saw this, uh, this variation um, with um, higher accelerations on the day side and lower accelerations on the night side. So this already gave, gave the first idea of uh, the influence of um, sunlight. And uh, as we know now, uh, the extreme ultraviolet part of the sunlight on the upper atmosphere. On the right, by the same um, researcher, a paper uh, from quite a bit later, but using data from the Explorer 8 satellite. So this was, was one of the first American satellites launched in 1960, um, where he already made the step from these accelerations to densities. And um, you can see the, in the, the second row, the diurnal variation. So that's basically similar to this day-night vector on the left. Uh, but at that time, they also found that there was a semi-annual variation. And you see all of these um, uh, on the top part of that plot, uh, yeah, more rapid fluctuations. And these were found to actually correlate quite, ni quite nicely with the 10.7 centimeter solar flux. So that's basically a radio telescope uh, that's looking at the sun every day and measures how much energy at this 10.7 centimeter radio wavelength is coming in. Uh, and if you plot that, uh, underneath the density, you can see that it, uh, it correlates quite nicely. And this was the basis of the first um, um, models of the upper atmosphere that were used also for planning satellite missions. There are also some peaks that are related to this geomagnetic index AP. So this, this is derived from magnetometers on the ground. Um, if this is a very high value above 100, then, then there's a, yeah, a good uh, geomagnetic storm uh, going on. For example, we see there one in uh, early 1967. Uh, the problem is that these, these also mostly occur when there are big sunspots on the sun that emit quite a lot of 10.7 centimeter solar flux. So to disentangle this geomagnetic index influence and the solar flux index was, was not always uh, so easy. But of course, the more data you get in, the, the easier that gets. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to include these pictures. I think the left one is from a museum. Uh, model of Sputnik 2. This was also the first artificial satellite that had a, a living creature on board, a dog called Laika. And on the right, I think this is probably the actual satellite, or it might be a test model uh, of uh, Explorer 8, just to give a sense of the scale and, and, and what these satellites look like. And also to go to the modern age, or at least more modern, on the left, we see the GEM satellite here, and on the right, the two gray satellites. And um, especially the GRACE satellites are a very successful mission. Uh, there's now a GRACE follow-on mission, actually, with, with uh, uh, quite similar satellites um, to measure the gravity field of the Earth. And basically, the drag on the satellites is a, um, a nuisance if you want to measure quite precisely the, the gravity field by looking at the motion of the satellites. So that's why these satellites, uh, all three of these, had uh, accelerometers on board. And uh, yeah, this, this proved to be quite a nice uh, a benefit to uh, gaining more knowledge on the thermosphere as well. So basically, um, um, in, in, in our branch of science of the Earth atmosphere, we have hijacked on the, um, yeah, the, the effort that was made by uh, the gravity field modeling community. Um, we have made use of their instruments and uh, uh, made good science out of that. Uh, this is a, a picture from my thesis from these two satellites, uh, CHAMP and GRACE A. And uh, at the top, uh, you see the actual observations. In this case, not from the accelerometers, but from uh, another type of data. This was just done to check uh, how well you could derive uh, also densities from this, uh, what's called two line element data. So it's a very coarse type of data. Uh, and you can compare that with models. And you can also um, uh, then uh, compute the ratio of the data over the model. And uh, you can see that they show very similar uh, variations, even though the satellites were at very different altitudes and also, also different, uh, the orbit was, uh, uh, orbits were not aligned in terms of the day night side of the Earth or the dusk dun side, uh, dusk dawn side of the Earth. Um, but also here you can see the influence uh, and the correlation with uh, the solar radio flux and, and the geomagnetic indices. For example, in October, end of October, uh, beginning of November 2003, we see very large peaks. That was a very active time on the sun. And we also see these very large peaks 
um, in the densities of both these uh, missions. And, and uh, yeah, if you look at the scale again on the of the density, it's a logarithmic scale. So there's a factor of two or three, even in on these daily average uh, densities. And uh, the actual peak densities within an orbit were, were even a factor of 10 or so, uh, just like uh, the example that I showed with Swarm. Um, and you could, you, the, the, the advantage of this two-line element method is that you can apply it to lots of different satellites and space debris objects. Uh, it's based on uh, space surveillance radar data. And um, um, there's a, a catalog that's made available uh, on the website called spacetrack.org. Uh, currently, uh, it's the uh, US Space Command. Uh, back in the day, it was the Air Force. Uh, that uh, was responsible for gathering this data and publishing it. And it's very nice that it is publicly available. And here you can see it's sorted uh, as a function of altitude, different objects that have, have different perigee altitudes. And you can see that they show very similar uh, density ratios. So they basically show similar errors in, in the model of the upper atmosphere. And this means that this, this uh, information can be also be used quite well to uh, uh, get information on the upper atmosphere. Um, a colleague, uh, John Emmert, has uh, uh, very elaborately uh, looked at this, uh, this data and created these long time series since the late 1960s until uh, the current day. Uh, so this is a, a plot on the left from a, a recent publication. And here you can see basically multiple solar cycles, um, upper atmospheric densities from many objects, of many of these TLEs. Um, at uh, 550, 400, and 250 kilometers altitude. And it's immediately obvious that there is uh, there seems to be some sort of trend. And partly this trend is due to changes in the activity of the sun. For example, the, the solar cycle between 2010 and 2020 was a lot less uh, active than uh, the ones before. Um, but also, uh, even in solar minima, where the, the conditions on the sun were more comparable, uh, yeah, you see that the, the recent minima were very low compared to the earlier ones, um, but also in the earlier ones, there's a trend. Uh, so people have been trying to disentangle these trends. And on the right, you see a, a sort of overview plot of uh, different papers uh, where uh, people have used models and observations to try to estimate these trends. And we see trends on the order of you know two to six, sometimes even eight percent per decade, depending also on uh, uh, whether you look at solar max or solar min, uh, or which time of year uh, you look at. Um, and uh, the reason behind this trend is believed to be uh, cooling of the upper atmosphere, um, which takes place. And uh, yeah, this is of concern because that means that the atmosphere is basically over long time periods contracting, and satellite drag is getting less and less. And this is currently not uh, part of most models. So, uh, yeah, if you make simulations of satellite missions long into the future uh, and you're using a very old model, uh, and that's still quite often done that people are using models from the 1980s or 1990s or even earlier, uh, then that, uh, yeah, that will impact the decisions you make based on your simulations. And we'll get to that uh, when we talk about impacts as well. So that's basically the last major part of this, uh, this talk. Uh, I will, of course, come to debris, but I will first um, uh, give one example of, of operations, um, just active satellites. There are many uh, Earth observation satellites, for example, that have a repeat cycle. Uh, that means that for their science, it, it, it's advantageous to make uh, measurements at the same location repeatedly. Um, uh, yeah, examples of this, of this are Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-3. So those are current satellites, but also these ERS and NTSAT satellites that I showed earlier. Uh, had this uh, these repeat cycles. And the way to do this is to make sure that you have an integer number of orbits for an integer number of days. So for example, for Sentinel-1, uh, in 12 days, it makes exactly 175 orbits. And then you get a pattern like the one on the bottom. Uh, that's the pattern for Sentinel-3. Um, so the, the pattern for Sentinel-1 would be a bit more coarse. Uh, and, and, and then uh, for every 12-day period, this pattern would exactly repeat. And then you can more easily, for example, determine trends in uh, surface deformations or sea level, uh, because you're not looking at uh, um, you know, 10 kilometers to the west or to the east, but it stays within, in the case of ERS and MPSOC, one kilometers. Uh, 
And the way that this is done is that uh, uh, there's a nominal altitude, but of course, due to drag, the, the satellite altitude is constantly lowered. And uh, that means also that this is not an integer number of, uh, of, of orbits per integer number of days anymore. Uh, so you have to have some sort of dead band. And then uh, when the satellite reaches the dead band on the east side, you have to do a maneuver. And then you hope that it drifts all the way to the rest of the dead band. And then you have to do the entire thing again. And of course, the, this, this drift, these arrows with drift, the, the speed that it goes through this entire thing depends on the density in the upper atmosphere. And this is an example on the right here of, of Envisat, uh, where you can see the altitude offset. You can see the, the maneuvers. That's why you get this sawtooth shape and uh, the resulting east-west offset. And here you can also see that it was not really, uh, it was not really easy to actually re re uh, reach this um, uh, west um, minus one um, part of this uh, cycle. Um, because you have to, of course, be able to predict the density to, to uh, choose the right maneuver. And that's not always easy. We can also see here again at the end of October 2003, we had a lot of extra drag. You see a rapid decay, uh, more rapid decay of the satellite at the end of October. And uh, the subsequent uh, uh, loop uh, through this procedure is also, uh, it stayed all the way on the, uh, I think it's the east side of this, uh, this dead band. Uh, so this means actually that in this in the operation you use a lot more fuel than would be needed if you would have a perfect understanding of what the thermosphere is going to do, how uh, uh, the solar activity is influencing it. Unfortunately, we do not know this, uh, and this is uh, yeah, costing some extra maneuvers and uh, some extra fuel. So now to the topic of debris. I have only a uh, little time left. So I will go a little bit more quickly through this. ESA publishes a very nice uh, annual report on the space environment. And here we can see uh, the debris uh, and the active satellites, the payloads, split up into colors. And we can see that especially since uh, about 2008, uh, there have been rapid increases. And there are a number of factors related to this. Around that time, there were a number of fragmentation events. You can see in the categories here, rocket fragmentation debris and payload fragmentation debris, that they are actually quite substantial um, parts of uh, the number of objects that place in orbit. Uh, so that means that satellites and rockets, they sometimes break up due to explosions or collisions. Um, and these explosions can be uh, by accident but, or, and collisions, but there have been also uh, anti-satellite tests. And, and uh, yeah, that's, of course, uh, generating uh, debris on purpose, uh, which is uh, not a good thing, to, to say the least. Uh, if we look at active satellites that are launched into orbit, we get an even bigger uh, uh, brightening picture. Uh, here we see at around 2012, uh, a small jump in uh, the number of objects that is launched. And this is the, the era that the uh, CubeSats really took off. Uh, but uh, since um, yeah, about 2018, uh, an even larger jump and, and especially in the last few years, uh, we get the rise of mega constellations like Starlink. And uh, you can also see that in the, uh, the mass of the satellites. First, we get this, this jump in the, the very small, less than 10 kilogram class. But uh, currently, these uh, mega constellations, they're actually not that small. They're in this uh, second to largest class of 100 to 1,000 kilograms. Um, and then if you look at the, over the years on the left axis and the height on the, uh, the bottom axis, um, yeah, where are these uh, extra satellites going? Uh, fortunately, we see that, that uh, the, the, the constellations have been largely concentrated in this 450, 500, 600 altitude range. And the lifetime of satellites there is, is uh, more, much more limited than, for example, at uh, 1,000 or 1,200 uh, kilometers. It used to be, uh, if you look at around 2005, you can very faintly see uh, if your screen can show these colors that uh, at around 700, 800 kilometers, that, that, that's where the space was much uh, you know, the most crowded. Uh, but currently, we see this uh, this trend towards lower altitudes where uh, these mega constellations are launched. And um, this crowded space it it gives problems. Um, not only these accidental uh, large collisions that that we already saw in this this trend graph, but also smaller collisions on the right here. Uh, um, 
You see a dent in the solar panel uh, of the Sentinel 1A satellite. Uh, we see a tweet from uh, the, the Space Defense Squadron that uh, tracks the satellite. Uh, there's a large Earth observation satellite called World Fuel 2, and they found eight debris pieces. Uh, so there must have been a collision, and, and some part of the satellite must have broken off eight, in eight pieces. Um, but fortunately, the, the operator of the satellite uh, um, uh, confirmed that the satellite was still operational. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be catastrophic, but uh, that, of course, still very concerning. Um, yeah, people often have some sort of misconception of the space resaturation uh, with, with these, these, this view that, that shows at the beginning of the movie. You can get the idea that, that low Earth orbit is very crowded. But this is a, a, an animation that I made on the, the privateer website. They have this very nice tool to visualize uh, debris in orbit. Uh, but if you zoom in, you can see, for example, uh, over a country like France, you see a handful of objects at the time. So by no means, it's a sort of traffic jam on the highway type situation. Space is still very large. And you must imagine, of course, that these satellites are all at uh, usually at different altitudes. But still, um, you know, if you operate an active satellite at around four or 500 kilometers, then quite often you get the warning that uh, other satellites are coming too close and you have to make maneuvers. Um, a few slides from uh, Matthew Brown, who is on the, the ISI team of, uh, on long-term change in the upper atmosphere. Uh, he made simulations of uh, uh, greenhouse cooling in uh, an atmospheric model. And based on the, the level of CO2 concentrations, he computed here uh, the density change over time. So the density over the coming decades, it, it is expected to reduce because of the increasing CO2 concentrations. And on the next plot, you can see the consequences for this. Uh, these are different scenarios uh, for the IPCC uh, about uh, the CO2 concentrations. And for each of these scenarios, you get a different trend graph of the increase in the number of objects. Uh, because the, set, the upper atmosphere is contracting, the upper atmosphere uh, can act less efficiently as a sort of cleanup mechanism for debris. Um, debris objects will re-enter less quickly. And that's, of course, uh, of concern. Uh, but you can also see the large time scale on this plot. And uh, the, the lines are very close together at the beginning. But uh, basically, the changes or the, the decisions that we make now, uh, they can have very large consequences uh, 100 years from now. So that's, that's basically the main message of uh, Matthew's very important work here. Um, another example is uh, re-entry. So I started the talk with this example of uh, uh, this big Chinese uh, rocket upper stage. This is a different example where we see uh, predicted re-entry. And of course, if, if the re-entry is still far away, for example, this re-entry happened in early April uh, 2018. Uh, but in early March, uh, there was an uncertainty of uh, yeah, about two weeks uh, about where this uh, re-entry would happen. Uh, but as the date becomes closer, you can expect this window to become smaller. But what is uh, interesting here is that this window uh, moves up and down over time, over the weeks. And the reason for this is also uh, that the thermosphere is very variable. And here I've put some parameters, space weather parameters, um, the magnetic activity um, as measured by magnetometers on the Earth, and also the solar wind conditions outside of the mag magnetosphere on the Earth. And if you put these two together, uh, you can find the reason for this variability. So at some point, the drag on the rocket is large. And then if you, do, um, uh, if you don't know about this, uh, variability, you, you uh, do your predictions and you, you expect that the, the drag will stay this large. And then the solar wind declines again, the geomagnetic activity decreases, um, and the drag decreases. And then the date predicted to re-entry date becomes later again. And this goes back and forth a couple of times in this, uh, these types of simulations. And uh, this is actually very difficult to disentangle because for these types of objects, we usually have very limited information on the area of the object because it might be tumbling, it might be tumbling at different rates or in different orientations. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, if, if the, the, the tumbling mode changes, it also can, get, uh, can have these types of effects. But in this case, probably most of this variability was due to uh, the solar wind conditions and the geomagnetic activity. 
Then to, to finish up uh, the Starlink example, uh, we saw this launch in uh, February um, last year, almost a year ago, February 3. And this is the public information about the height of the satellites uh, that I put in the graph. And we can see uh, quite a number of these objects go to very low heights quite rapidly. And uh, also reported re-entries uh, from the spacetrack.org website. Uh, and the statement that I showed on the previous slide and also at the beginning was made on February 8th. Um, and we can see just a few objects, 11 of, I think it was 49 objects, um, that, uh, that actually started their orbit uh, raising like it was supposed to happen. Um, so if we look at the, the, the height of the launches, uh, the brown launch is the one at the beginning of February. And we can actually see that the, the density was quite a bit higher than at the previous launches, as SpaceX or Starlink also mentioned in their uh, uh, news release. Um, we also see very nicely here that uh, they made very quick um, mitigation action by launching into a higher altitude, where the density uh, along the orbit was much uh, smaller. Um, so they, they actually launched into, the, into this, this uh, lower orbit um, because they they uh, uh, wanted to prevent um, satellites that were not functioning correctly to become debris that stay too long in orbit, but they put the satellites a bit too low. Um, so how to go forward in this domain? Um, yeah, I think most of you will probably have heard about the Kessler syndrome, where uh, we get a runaway collision effect, and uh, this uh, is a still from the movie Wally where uh, the uh, space gets so crowded that uh, you actually always have a collision when you want to go into orbit. Uh, this is, of course, very unrealistic, but it's a fun part of the movie. Um, and I think there are very many misconceptions or, or misunderstandings about the Kessler syndrome. I heard someone mention that, uh, you know, what, ha what happens if we get an asteroid towards Earth and we want to launch a mission to deflect it, and we can't do it because it's too crowded in space. Well, that, that's basically this situation, um, but that's not how it works. You, you, you saw that, that, that basically space is still very, very empty. But uh, the, the, the problem is that it becomes more and more problematic to plan these collision avoidance maneuvers if there are uh, this, this continuing increase of, of objects. And uh, we also saw that decisions on the use of low Earth orbits made in the past as well as now will affect the sustainability of space operations over the next centuries. Now, one solution will be to remove debris from orbit. I think this is a very nice animation uh, from the ESA website uh, about removing the ERS satellite, ERS-2, I guess, uh, or ERS-1. Uh, but, but you can also see uh, immediately the problem. This, this object is tumbling, and uh, you have to adjust to the tumbling rate with your uh, Chaser spacecraft. Uh, so this is uh, still science fiction, I think. I, I think this will be very expensive and very difficult to, uh, to achieve like this for objects like this. Um, so scenarios, um, basically we have to make decisions and we will have to see what happens. So what will the solar activity be like? How does greenhouse cooling evolve? How many mega constellations will be launched in which orbits? Will we move to very low Earth orbits? So this, this trend that uh, we're now launching most objects uh, into this uh, 400 to 600 instead of the 700 to 900 kilometer range. Uh, can we go even lower than that? Uh, what will be the reliability of automated collision avoidance and post-mission disposal procedures? How successful will we be in the debris removal, like in the last animation, and surfacing missions? So these are all trends for the coming years and decades. And, and are there any unforeseen interactions between the above elements? How well does all of this work when we get a really huge geomagnetic storm and we maybe lose track? Um, um, have difficulty tracking some of the, these degree objects. Uh, lots of open questions. Of course, we need data. I think I've already well over time, so I'm going to, to skip most of this, except to, to mention that we do not only need thermosphere data, but also better data on what the sun is doing, long time series, uh, upstream solar wind data. Uh, so the space weather, uh, basic space weather data uh, improvements that are planned for that will actually really help also for this type of problem. And um, I think we can do better with international sharing of data. 
so a lot of data is currently locked away in proprietary archives by, by space operators. And there have been heroic efforts uh, by people trying to unlock uh, long-term time series. And this is extremely valuable and, and should be an example. So my last question of this talk is how can we further improve the international cooperation and sharing of data and knowledge between the public and private space sectors and academia? And uh, I want to apologize for going over time and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ilko. Yeah, that was a fascinating talk. <laughs> and okay, let's go for, for some questions. So if if in the audience people have questions, please write them down in, in the chat and we'll have uh, guests then some time to, to go through them. So to start with, uh, I think there are three questions which could fit into one about, first was about the force. Could you give an estimate of the order of magnitude of the force in Newton? And what does it depend on besides mass and area? Uh, are there other parameters, I guess, shape and so? And does the, the plasma wake play a role there? Yeah, so um, the, the uh, magnitude of the force, uh, we're basically measuring this in, in, in terms of acceleration in nanometers per second squared. And then it, of course, depends on the mass of the, the satellite. And, and for a satellite like Gauche at 250 kilometers altitude, it could be 1,000 of nanometers per second squared, but for Champ and Grace, it can be only 100 or 10 um, at very low solar activity. So that's this order of magnitude. It's it's uh, one, I guess, one billionth of um, or less of the, the gravity on the surface of the Earth. So it's very small. But of course, it adds up over time. Um, I think plasma effects, so so that's basically where I've only talked here about the interaction of the satellite with neutral particles. I think the uh, actual mass of the charged particles is uh, uh, less than a fraction of a percent. So that does not really have to be taken into account because we already have quite large uncertainties uh, for the neutral part. But of course, there can be other interactions there. Um, I have not seen evidence in, in the observations and the comparisons with the models that that plays a huge role below 500 kilometers. But of course, if you have very small objects and at higher altitudes, then, then maybe things might be different. I've not really looked into that. Hmm. And I think what other uh, yeah. parameters of shape? Yes. Uh, I think this elongated shape, that's the most important. I think I've covered, uh, covered that. If you have a very elongated shape, you have a quite a different drag coefficient than if you have a very compact shape. Okay. Um, so I so saw, I see that um, Steve Spengler had a question. If uh, I cannot unlock his mic, uh, really, could you please allow me to unlock his mic? Otherwise, I'll read up, I read aloud his, his question. Is, so there have been question, uh, suggestions that climate change could alter wind patterns in the stratosphere, such as the polar vortex. That was a talk a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Have there been any studies of the possible variation in the flux of upward propagating atmospheric waves as the warm as the planet warms? And could this potentially modify the structure of the upper atmosphere and influence drag? Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Yeah. I think this is I, I have not I do not know uh, of particular papers that go into this, but I think this is inherent if you use whole atmosphere models, they they uh, um, to some extent, uh, yeah, include this in their physics. But I think the current whole atmosphere models, I'm, I'm not sure whether um, uh, their resolution is good enough and, and the way it, they are driven is good enough to answer mm -hmm. this. But I'm not an expert on these, these types of models, so we would have to ask uh, the experts on that. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, that's very interesting to consider. So you, Hudson, had another question about the impact of flares. Uh, you do, can you... Do you can you unmute your mic, please? Yeah, I, I just want to. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I want to just ask if on about short time scale effects. And I, I just on one of your graphs, there was what looked like very high signal to noise ratio, and one could see uh, fluctuations in drag. Maybe it was a UTEL sat gra uh, graphic, I don't know, on the time scales down to a day or so. And I'm just wondering what is the limit of this, and can can one ever expect to see kind of instantaneous effects of individual solar flares, for example, in satellite drag? Yes, yes, there, there are examples of that. 
So the accelerometer satellites, Champ and Grace and Goche that I, I talked about, and currently Swarm is the, the, the big example of those types of missions, and Grace follow-on. Uh, they basically uh, can give an estimate of the density along the orbit every second or every 10 seconds, so with very high cadence uh, uh, for this discipline, at least. Uh, so that's that's sufficient to see very quick changes, And uh, but you need a huge flare to see a signal, but there are papers for example, about the 2003 um, uh, Halloween event, which was a big geomagnetic storm, but to, just before the storm started, there was also a huge flare and the effects on the drag uh, have been observed and, and uh, yeah, they basically stand out in the, in the plot of the, uh, of the observed densities. So that's, that's certainly possible, but that was uh, uh, well above X10 class flare. Hmm. Okay. So uh, Timofey had a question about uh, sol a solar related question as well. So Timofey, um, can you unmute your mic? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah, good. Yeah, my question was about the solar rotation because 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 of that there could be also some fast and strong uh, changes in EUV and whether it is dangerous for in satellite operations or is it all well predicted and therefore already included in uh, the orbit corrections? Yeah, so so uh, EUV is often, um, you know, not really, uh, people do not realize it's so important, but it is. And especially for this type of, of plot, where you show over a couple of months, uh, the evolution of the orbit, uh, EUV is, a, is, is usually a stronger driver than, uh, than the geomagnetic activity. And uh, yeah, to some extent, uh, we can predict it, but there are of course errors that that, that lead to this uh, type of plot being less ideal than uh, yeah that could be if we would have better uh, predictions of EUV. Mm. Okay. So you have a question uh, by a colleague, I guess, <laughs> um, yeah. Bert van der Oort. If you could uh, unmute your mic, please. Yes, it, uh, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah, it's simply a question that there are plans by ESA to go to active space uh, traffic management. And I was wondering what Eric was thinking about these uh, IDs, given all uncertainties which are there in solar activity and also the behavior of the thermosphere, mesosphere. Thank you. Yeah, Bert, so uh, I, I think in terms of active space traffic management, do you mean automated maneuvering uh, to yeah. avoid collisions? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that is already being done, for example, by the, the Starlink constellation, and they do many maneuvers. Uh, they have, of course, ion thrusters, so it does not cost them uh, that much. It's, it's probably adjustments of, of uh, maneuvers they would otherwise do to keep orbit. And uh, yeah, I think other operators in space will follow that example. And uh, it will be, uh, yeah, I think it will save uh, a lot of effort from doing everything manually and having to check every uh, single uh, potential, um, what, they, what they call consumption event. Um, so I think that's the way forward. But of course, uh, our limitations in being able to predict EUV and geomagnetic storms, they have, uh, and, uh, an influence on that. And uh, for example, if we do not exactly know when a geomagnetic storm will arrive, uh, we have to uh, probably um, increase the safety margin on where we are going to maneuver. And, and we will have less certainty that when we do a maneuver, we will not uh, get a conjunction with another object. So, so there is this, uh, this limit. And uh, yeah, if the number of, of objects increases, uh, like in 100 or 200 years, there might be a, um, an actual hard limit to what is possible there. Mm. Okay. So, uh, Leif raised his hand. I guess it's Leif Solgaard. So, Leif, if you want to speak up, that will be easier. Um, yeah. I put in the chat a comment. The solar EUV creates the E region. Um, is um, the ionization in the E region. The neutral winds blows those ions across the Earth's magnetic field that gives a current. This current produces a magnetic uh, 
field on the ground. And this was discovered 300 years ago, exactly this month by Charles Graham in London. And we have been keeping track of that ever since. So we actually have a, an idea of the EOV going back 300 years. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. I, I know about this, this dyna, dynamo effect, um, but I've never thought about using this as a proxy for EUV for uh, you know long time history. Yeah. Uh, it might be interesting to look into further. Thanks for yeah. the suggestion. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, we have uh, modern data, of course, the last 50 years or so. Yeah. We can establish that there's a very, very, very tight relation between the two. And of course, we know the physical processes that uh, create that. So um, um, interestingly enough, we can track solar EUV back 300 years. Mm -hmm. so that uh, gives us a long-term perspective. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Leif. This is interesting indeed to go backwards three centuries. <laughs> it's really exceptional. Um, so we had a question by Yoshita Barwa. Uh, I will also, if you, um, if you can s turn on your mic, it will be easier. Yes. Uh, hello. Yeah. Thank you so yes. much. Uh, so my question was, I think, uh, thermospheric density that is retrieved from accelerometer data, uh, that is mostly done using the drag equation. Uh, if that is right. Uh, how does uh, the, I mean, how rapidly does the drag coefficient change with altitude? Uh, and I mean, if that, uh, I mean, if the change in drag coefficient with altitude is significant, how much in confidence can we take uh, these thermospheric density values to be? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. It's correct that we use the, the drag equation and the the drag coefficient is basically a sort of conversion factor between acceleration and density. So if you make an error in the drag coefficient, we get an error in the retrieved density. And uh, the question is, how rapidly does this drag coefficient change? So the drag coefficient, of course, is a function of the, the shape and the orientation. Um, for satellites like RACE, we know this very well from star cameras and uh, uh, yeah, models that we built of the, the shape of the satellite. Uh, so the the, the uh, factors that can change it are these the mass of the gas par gas particles and the the temperature, and these do not usually change very rapidly, but they do introduce an error because we do not know them, and and especially at solar minimum when the the satellites uh, the satellites are at 450 550 kilometers at solar minimum there might be a substantial uh, amount of helium and of course it varies with solar activity, uh, th this amount of helium, and we do not know about this. So that's actually a quite probably the largest uh, um, error source in this data at those uh, altitudes. Okay. okay. Can I please ask a, a quick thing I'm sure. related to this? Yeah, uh, so I mean, in the drag equation, we already incorporate the area to mass ratio. So how else does the drag coefficient depend on the shape of the satellite? I mean, yeah, so that, that's a, a, also a good question. So basically the drag coefficients, if, if you look at the definition, uh, basically you have to have a, 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 a sort of physical model to calculate the entire acceleration based on the shape and the orientation and the, the, the speed and temperature of your gas particles. And then the drag coefficient is just a way to normalize it. Uh, so that, that's how it's done for aircraft, but also for satellites. Um, and uh, it, it's basically an agreement that you make with yourself. I normalize my drag acceleration by dividing by a certain reference area. Um, and if you choose a different er reference area, you get a different, different drag coefficient. So it's, 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 uh, I, I understand the question uh, and where it's coming from, but it's basically, in reality, the other way around, uh, it's just uh, an agreement that you make and you have to be self-consistent. Hmm. Okay. So I guess it's getting a bit late for us all. <laughs> so I wish to thank you again, Ilko, for this interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, 
So uh, for all of you, you can you can still listen to this talk. It will be uh, available on EC's website uh, from tomorrow onwards. And I just want to tell you that next week we'll be talking about um, the risks for those traveling to other planets. The week after, we will be dealing with GNSS, and after that, with artificial intelligence, how this can be used. And finally, we will finish with two talks about uh, the risks for uh, uh, from the viewpoint of uh, space insurers, so a completely different approach. And as usual, you're welcome to attend, and um, thank you very much for being for attending this seminar, and hopefully see you next week or any other time at EC or for a webinar. And thank you again, Ilko. <laughs> Thank you. Thank everyone for their attention as well.